I was going through my storage unit looking for stuff to send to recycling because yes, I do recycle a lot of stuff. About 10 VCRs is going out right now. And I found my old Sony KV-1365 color monitor I've had forever. It was used in my studio days. So I figured I'd check it out and see if it works. And guess what? It's got a problem. Surprise, surprise. So today we're gonna fix it because this piece is one that I'm definitely hanging on to. Here I have a Sony. This is the KV-1365 and it seems to have a mind of its own. See? It's flicking back and forth between uh, the video input and the tuner all by itself. Even though it's on video input mode now, the button's pressed in. It's a mechanical switch on this one. And yet it's switching between input and TV. See what I mean? You don't, have to, you don't even have to touch it. This is a non-remote control set. If you look on the front of this one here, it's just got mechanical buttons. There is no remote control, so I know some people are saying, oh, you're probably pressing a button on the remote. No, I'm not pressing any buttons. The set is switching back and forth on its own. It'll do it probably with my hand sitting in the screen. This is not a remote control set. This is a straight set. There's a button on the front here, TV video, and it sits there, as you can see, it sits there and switches back and forth. Now this, this TV has been sitting for a number of years unused. This TV probably hasn't been turned on in, you know, in 10 years or more. Yeah, try for more like 20 years. Looks like the, the buttons aren't working on the tuner either. Yeah, so we can see. So that's the work we've got cut out for us on this one today. The date on the back of this TV manufactured, this one came from Japan, by the way. This is a Japanese made, not an American made one. Um, this one was manufactured in October 1985. As you can see and it was calibrated November 1989 it looks like stickers coming off the back this was uh, my set used in my production studio back in the 80s before everything went to digital this was back in the day when we were doing a B roll and this would have been one of my preview monitors. I had a couple of them and uh, I had two of these. These would have been monitoring the playback decks for AB roll through an MX1 mixer so I could view the camera picture because even though the MX1 had the little windows on the on its preview monitor they were kind of useless. I liked a full-size screen for when I was editing live like two tapes mixed, mixed, doing a live mix. So I had two of these. I've only got one left. And uh, I had a little Panasonic monitor that was a preview monitor for previewing the effects. And then I had a larger version of this. Still got that one. KV1965, which was the I used as my program monitor. And um, I had two of these. I had one for the titler, so a third one and I had a preview monitor and I had my program monitor so at one point I had five monitors in my studio five five small monitor well four small monitors and a larger one and uh, two playback machines and a record deck and an MX mixer MX1 mixer and an audio mixer that I, I fixed before that was part of my uh, my studio that was uh, used for production so this is one of the few pieces that remain I got rid of the other ones. I've got the 1965 still, and I've kept this one. And uh, 
I still got the MX1 mixer kicking around somewhere too, but most of the other stuff is is long gone. So let's open this one up and see why it's not working. There it is. A Sony Trinitron. That wonderful Trinitron tube. Everybody was uh, crowing about how great they were. They were good, that's for sure. But uh, they weren't very high resolution. But they did deliver a fairly good picture most of the time. Unless you drop them on their face. TV tip over like that and land on its face. Um, yeah, not good for the aperture grill. Break the aperture grill. Or not break it, but dislodge the aperture grill. In the front of a Trinitron tube, there's a, a, a grill a grill across the front with a bunch of fine vertical wires. And uh, it's precision mounted in the bell of the tube before the frit seal is put on, before the screen's put on the frit seal. And the problem is, it's just anchored to glass. And well, you know what happens to glass if you uh, bump it or, or jar it, it can, uh, it can break. And the little pegs on the inside of the bell of the tube that the that the aperture grill sat on, and they, they basically sat in the bell of the tube on little glass little glass supports, and then the frit then the screen was placed in front of it, and the frit seal glued glued down. This is in the early assembly of the tube, and uh, well, if the tube was subjected to pretty much any type of shock, it could cause that aperture grill to shift slightly and if it shifts even a millimeter or less you'll never get the convergence or the purity right it's just never going to happen I would get new TVs that we had to change a picture tube on brand new because the purity was bad and we would change a new tube and find that the new tube was just as bad because the carrier bounced it during the shipment so it was uh, yeah they were uh, they were great but but um, as I say the the tubes themselves were easy to damage, especially the large ones. So here's the dirty circuit board on this, and this is very dusty and dirty. As I say, this thing's been sitting in storage, you know, for probably since the I'm going to say. Oh, this has been in storage probably since. I'm trying to remember when I went full. Uh, full. Nonlinear would have been. Uh, Probably 97, maybe. That's when this was would have been all taken down. 96 or 97. I went to I went to nonlinear in 96, I think. But the first the first generation of nonlinear was kind of useless because you're limited to only about four minutes. You could work on four minute chunks at once. And then I bought the Matrox, which was a Canadian made card called the Matrox RT2000, running. I think it was Windows 98. That one allowed unlimited, it was done in real time and it was unlimited uh, clips because the way it stored, even though even though the file size was still limited to two gigabytes, it would split the files into multiple two gigabyte files and then seamlessly join them on playback. So that got around the limitation of the earlier systems which you were limited to two gigabyte files. Yeah, it was a, a big step. So when that when that came out, I stopped using most of the analog gear. The analog gear was put out to pasture, so to speak. Okay, I'm thinking something in this switch here is, is a problem. Because, to say, all one has to do is just look at it, and it switches inputs. It's a mechanical switch, as you can see, but it's likely controlling electronic switching on the set itself. One of the rubber, uh, one of the rubber supports for the picture tube has come out. It's probably why the purity's off. Those are what hold the yoke in place. Now this is going to be loaded with bad caps, but we're not worried about changing any bad caps unless I find that the picture is is bad. But uh, as I say, it's 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 a very old TV, but it still works. So let's make it work properly. Now one thing I'll notice on this set that a lot of TVs didn't have, but this one here has a uh, audio output transformer right here. And that's because, here's the leads going to the speaker, you notice there's three leads, that's because this set had an earphone on it. It had an earphone jack. 
which was something a lot of TVs did not have because with the hot chassis, you couldn't do that. These are also the ones that had the, the tuner problems and the IF can problems for the tuner. Uh, it, it uses opto isolation. If you look over here, you'll see there's two optical isolators on the board right here. And what these are for is these are to isolate the video because it's got AV inputs and it's a hot chassis. So people have in the past said, well, why not? You, well, you know, it'd be easy to put RGB into a TV. And yes, it is because most of the chips, most of the jungle chips like this have an RGB input that is used for the on-screen graphics. And it's easy just to modulate those with video for red, green, and blue. The, the problem is that the TV itself needs to be isolated because this is all on a hot chassis. The AV jacks on the back are isolated through these opto isolators, so they operate with their own isolated power supply, which is picked off of the flyback, by the way, off of a secondary off the flyback. The AV input has its own buffer amplifier, which is running off of an isolated source, which is coupled through these optical couplers onto the hot side, the hot side of the chassis. So you've got a cold side and a hot side. All this is part of the hot side, right? Your sink separator, horizontal oscillator, vertical oscillator. This is all on the hot side of the chassis. The AV input is on the cold side, isolated with these optical couplers here. And there'll be level controls, I believe. And there's an audio level control there. But anyway, and that's probably the video level control. Yeah, that one's, that one's the video level control to adjust the video level through the optical coupler. And that's the audio level control. So that's, uh, that's that. And then, of course, over here, the audio output transformer is what isolates the, the audio going to the speaker and the headphone jack. That's why you also can't just chop the speaker wire and put headphones on a conventional hot chassis. You need to isolate it with an, uh, with an audio output transformer. Otherwise, you run the risk of getting a shock because one side is going to be connected to the AC line. If we look with the meter to any ground point on the board, so we're about 800K. Is, is what the isolation is, which is not enough isolation to protect you from a jolt. So, depending on if you if that's plugged into neutral or whether it's reversed, it's a polarized plug on here. So, you know, you can only plug it on one way, and the the neutral will always be the wide blade. But if someone's electrical outlet is not wired correctly, then you're going to end up with AC line voltage right on these metal cover, uh, metal covers and um, and anything else that's exposed on the TV. It's isolated for the antenna and put back here. This is the antenna isolator. You'll see if you look around here, can you guys see it? You see the, see the white insulation material, it's epoxy. That isolates the, the lead going into the tuner from the metal terminal on the back. The metal terminal on the back is connected to this, but this is not connected to the tuner. If we look at that, this is safety 101 with, with AC operated TVs, I'm afraid. So we might as well get through this now, even though we've probably covered this before. But if I look at the meter, okay, the tuner, which is what I'm connected to now, is not connected See, we're in the mega ohm range, and it'll probably continue to go up. There's capacitors in there. This is connected to the screw terminal, right? But it's not connected to, we're talking mega ohms there. It's this isolation that does it. The AV inputs on the back, you see, we've got like four mega ohms isolation there, which is plenty. But from the the power lead it was only what 800k here's one of those thick film modules actually it's not even thick film it's just it's just it's one of those glass modules it's got uh, epoxy I guess on it to encapsulate it but that's the audio amplifier 
So if that burns out, well, I guess you could build an amplifier and put it in there, but it's just two transistors basically is what this one is. It's a, it's a class A, B or class B. We'd call it a thick film module, I think is how they would call it. Even though it does look like it's got conventional, looks like it's got conventional surface mounted resistors and capacitors. It's encapsulated, so you know, fairly difficult to try to repair it. But what I was getting this shot for was just to show you the tuner and the IF module. So the IF module is marked made in Japan, the tuner is made in Korea. So even by this stage of the game, Sony wasn't building all their own components, they were buying some stuff from other companies. And it's funny because Sony had just horrendous tuner problems on their TVs, but it was always in this can here. The IF can would go bad on them all. We'll check it on this one once I get the set properly working. So let's plug it in and uh, see where the fault lies. Actually, I'm going to flip the board on end first, just so I can inspect some connections on the bottom here. Make sure that we're not dealing with bad solder connections and so forth. Okay, first things first, let's fire the setup and see whether we've got any other issues other than the switch now that the board is out. I took a look at the bottom of the board and there looks to be some connections that are questionable, uh, especially around the, the uh, yoke plug back here, which you guys can't see, but I'll show you. But there's a, there's a, the yoke plug down here is, uh, I still can't see it. How can I bring this camera in? I noticed some what look like cold connections on the bottom here, on the bottom of the yoke plug. So I'm just going to wiggle this and just like that with the set on and see if, it, if we have a problem with the picture because if it's not acting up now I think it probably will be very soon because uh, the connections look to be pretty bad. So let's fire the set up and see what it does. I need to remind anybody who's working, anyone who's going to be working on a uh, CRT TV, use an isolation transformer always because these are hot chassis and keep your fingers away from the high voltage. Anything that's got a big red wire, good chance it's got high voltage on it. Keep your fingers away from it. Keep your fingers away from the back of the CRT socket. It's going to have high voltage too. Um, I know where to put my fingers, so don't tell me I'm not being safe because I know where the high voltage is and where to stay away from it. I will only be touching insulated parts with my fingers, my bare fingers. So let's turn the set on and see whether... Uh, better kill that sound. Yeah. There we go, you see? That, that yoke plug is bad. Now this switch is working. Not working properly though. We need to clean that switch. We need to clean that switch for starters, but there's a bad connection on the yoke plug. I, when I inspected it from the bottom, I found that when I when I was uh, looking at it, I noticed that the solder looked kind of crystallized on not only the uh, yoke plug but a few other things in here as well. But uh, this one's the service. This one's the centering. You see. See this one that centers the picture? Picture's a little bit on the small side, we can bump that up a bit. But when I was uh, looking at the board, uh, it looked like the, the connections were crystallized here. And, well, yes, as you can see, that one needs to be addressed. And we gotta clean the, uh, the, the switch. I think it's just the switch that needs to be cleaned. I was looking for my can of new call, there it is. Let's, Let's give this switch a shot of contact cleaner. We'll just do it right here. It's normal for these ones to display a white screen and there's no video input and that's due to the uh, the opto isolator. The way the opto isolator works, it works out like an inverted, it works in it like an inverted signal. So the 
lowest light level from the LED is white and the brightest light level from the LED is a sync pulse. So they invert the video before it goes to the optocoupler and then they invert the video. Well, I guess what it does is it creates the opposite. It creates the opposite on the phototransistor. So when the LED shines bright, the phototransistor conducts the most, which will then drop the voltage to the lowest level. And when the LED does not conduct, or the LED is the dimmest, the voltage is the highest. So the, that the optocoupler itself, just the way they operate, will invert your signal. If you follow where I'm getting at, as the voltage increases to the LED, the LED will increase its brightness. When the LED increases its brightness, it will cause the phototransistor to go into conduction. The phototransistor is grounded on one side and the other side's got the supply, the output rail, the supply voltage, and it will be modulated down. It will, it will drop in response to the incoming signal on the LED side. Now we're going to solve this problem. And I'm going to turn that off before I burn the screen. See what I mean? The uh, connections here are not good. And that's what's causing that vertical deflection loss. So we'll redo these ones. And these resistors here look like they've been pretty warm too. These are power resistors. So we'll reflow these ones. When soldering, you always heat the conductor, not the solder. So you want to heat the conductor up, get the conductor hot, and then flow your solder to the other side. Don't stick the solder right onto the iron itself. You know, contrary to what some people will claim, you do not need to remove the old solder before flowing new solder. It will mix. Even if it's lead-free solder, it will mix quite nicely. Of course, be sure your power is off and your set is unplugged before you do this. So let's fix this one here. We'll heat the pin up. These pins take a fair bit of heat to, to get the solder to flow. A very common problem on Sony where the horizontal drive transformers losing drive. The, connection would fail and you would lose drive. And that would cause the output transistor to blow. So we're going to take that take care of that while we're at it. This being a horizontal deflection, it's connected directly to the collector of the horizontal output transistor. So this one here will have a, a voltage of about a thousand volts peak to peak on this one when it's running. The base of the horizontal output transistor is connected here down through to this horizontal drive transformer. And these are notorious for developing bad connections. And if they do, and it breaks while the set is running, it will blow this transistor here every time. Guaranteed 100% blow the transistor. So whenever you see a Sony, especially a Sony, 
it's always a good idea to resolder the horizontal output or horizontal drive transformer and the horizontal drive transistor and even the horizontal output transistor. It's a good idea to do this just proactively because this is a very common mode of failure and when it does fail it's always going to blow the output transistor and these output transistors they were expensive 30 years ago I would imagine that they're even more so today considering that they probably haven't made the transistor in you know 25 30 years the output transformer the, the flyback generally uh, they don't have as many problems but it's always a good idea to inspect the pins and resolder as necessary. The ones that are going to be the most problematic are the ones that are handling the most current and the most voltage, which is the one that's connected to the horizontal output and its associated ground. Or it's, it's actually not a ground, it's actually is that going to be plus? Because the transformer itself is not grounded, the ground is actually through the emitter. This is the ground here. Okay, that should uh, I think keep this one going for a while. Not too worried about any of the other possible problems that a set like this could have, such as the tuner, because the tuner is not really going to ever be used in a set like this. A TV like this really only has value to somebody who's going to game, and uh, that might be where this ends up. Uh, regulator ICs back here. Again, they can develop bad connections. It doesn't look like there's a problem on this one. This looks fine, so we're going to leave that one alone. Maybe adjust our vertical height a bit just to uh, bring the picture up just to the edge because it seems to be a bit small. We'll adjust the vertical height, and uh, then I think this one here is ready to go back together. So if we look here, we're seeing the closed caption data. I've just got CNN playing here, so hopefully they won't tell. Good, we're going to go to a commercial. Excellent. Okay, we're seeing uh, some of this closed caption data up top here. It's going to adjust the vertical size control just to take that just off the edge of the screen, just like that. Right now, uh, maybe wait until they give me a picture that actually has something on it. There we go. There we go. So now I'm scanning just to the edge of the screen. This is actually broadcast in 4x3, this one. If I go up to my other test channels here, there we go, my aquarium, full screen, and my security cameras. And right to the edge here. See a bit of the edge, but that's okay. They actually produce a bit smaller than normal picture. What else do I have here that I can tune in? Oh, ZZ Top, better not put that on. That will definitely draw too much attention. Oh, that's the cable TV. That's the cable TV switch, okay. How's the other controls look? Dirty it looks like. Color, tint. picture and the other one down the brightness. We'll just give those a shot of cleaner while we're at it. Clean those controls up. Dude, that control's still looking pretty bad. I'm not getting any cleaner into it. I thought I did. There we go, it's getting a bit better.
That's looking good. Looking real good. It's a Sony. Okay, I say this one's uh, pretty much done. I'll throw this one back together and uh, put it away and forget about it for another 20 years. It'll probably still be working. Thanks for watching. We'll catch you in the next one. Bye for now.